Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're going to come back and do another week in review. I feel like it's been a while since I've been around, so I figured I'd give you an update on some of the things that are going on around here. Uh, I've been pretty busy. A lot of things have been happening here around the school. I've been uh, having a lot of assignments come in, a lot of, uh, a lot of, I wouldn't say projects, but a lot of things that I've had to grade for students. Our girls cross country team just won the state championship, so a shout out to them. Way to go girls. Our guys did really well also. Uh, really tough race for them. But anyway, so I've been really busy. A lot of things happening around here, uh, both both uh, in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. A lot of interesting things happening in Georgia. It seems like it's never going to rain and we have smoke blowing all over the metro. So uh, some clear signs of the apocalypse, apocalypse coming, maybe. Also, the election just happened recently, and so, of course, you've seen a lot of interesting information come across uh, with that. We're going to be starting political geography soon, so get into some pretty interesting conversations there. A lot of people talking about the Electoral College, getting rid of the Electoral College. Probably not a good idea. Electoral, co electoral College is a, a pretty ingenious system that was developed by the Founding Fathers. Found one of the uh, one of the biggest issues in terms of the Electoral College that people really don't seem to understand is that the whole purpose of the system there is to allow for all 50 states, I guess we have 51 uh, that go in there and allow for the Electoral College, but obviously 50 states, but all uh, the Electoral College is there so that each state itself has, uh, has, a, um, has an independent election. So it's not like one large election that happens uh, on, uh, on, on November 8th, uh, but instead, or on the Tuesday, uh, I guess this year it was November 8th, but on, that, on the Tuesday uh, in November, uh, but instead, it's like 50 separate elections that are going to happen. So the states themselves are deciding, holding an election, who their state is going to be voting for. And this is really important, especially when you talk about uh, the whole idea of the republic that we've set up and the federal system that's been set up. It gives the state some autonomy and some, uh, some identity as an independent political unit, which they really don't have a whole lot of. Uh, since the states are no longer able to elect senators and the senators go back to uh, are now elected by popular vote in the state which I would almost argue that we should go back to allowing the states to vote for representatives so that they have some representation at the federal level. Uh, the people now have redundant representation which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. A senator can't do a very good job of representing the, uh, uh, the entire population of a state so that to me is kind of silly. That's what you're representative for. Anyway, so I'm getting a little off topic because that's all for uh, that's all going to be a conversation for political geography. Uh, we have been in cultural geography for the last month or so. Uh, and cultural geography tends to be a topic that a lot of people like to discuss, a lot of teachers like to go into. Uh, in fact, a lot of people like to spend uh, a good amount of time here in, in cultural geography. And if it was, uh, if there's one thing that I can encourage you in as a teacher, uh, do not spend too much time in cultural geography. The important, the thing to focus on with cultural geography is going to be uh, really kind of the spread of culture, whether we're talking about pop culture and folk culture, the idea of globalization and pop culture in, in the world today, or if we're talking about language and religion, it's more about the spread of culture, the cultural landscape, kind of integrating the idea of, of globalization there and how uh, Western cultures are starting, uh, have been dominating over cultures of, of other peoples around the world. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of times with religion, the issue is we, we kind of get stuck in the, the individual uh, ideas presented within each religion. Let me encourage you, most of the focus should be on the geography of religion. Where Where's the religion located uh, in the world today? Where did it start? How did it spread? So talk about different types of diffusion. Uh, talking about the cultural landscape and so how is that religion going to impact the landscape and going through each of those uh, the various religions that you might discuss in class. So that's really where the focus should be. Don't spend too much time on culture. Again, it is really interesting, um, but there's a lot more to cover in the course. And if you spend too much time in culture, then you're probably going to get yourself behind. So we actually have a test coming up next week. Uh, so we're coming to a close on culture this week. We were dealing with religion. So what I like to do when we enter into the religion portion uh, is uh, the kids do most of the work in terms of understanding the big five, what I call the big five religions, right? Uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And so they do most of the work there looking at their book, maybe creating a chart or two for a kind of a study sheet or a cheat sheet. So I just spend more time looking at religions uh, that students aren't as familiar with, at least as far as I know, they're not as familiar with. So in the past, we've looked predominantly at Shintoism. We've looked at Taoism and Taoism. 
uh, and then we've also looked at the uh, the different tribal religions. So the concept of of animism and pantheism uh, in the different tribal religions. This year we had to take a little bit different route just because some of the resources that I've had in the past weren't, weren't available to me. Uh, and so we looked at Baha'i uh, and we also, we also looked at Sikhism. Uh, again, two religions that are becoming more prominent uh, in the world. Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion. Uh, and so that's becoming more prominent. Baha'i is, is spreading more. It's not a very large religion overall, uh, but it's spreading more. And so we took a look at those, uh, looked at some of the characteristics of them again. Uh, looking mostly at the idea of hearth, diffusion, and then cultural landscape. And then we took some time and we uh, we created some choropleth maps looking at the uh, the modern distribution of the big five so, we, so we're understanding where those particular religions are at uh, today. When we come back next week we're going to look at some uh, some specific situations in which religion is a source of conflict. That's typically when you find conflict uh, in the course and you find conflict uh, in the different topics. That's typically something that you may want to look at because it potentially could come up as a question. But certainly, uh, anytime there's conflict in the world, then that's going to be a, a cause for conversation because we want to understand what it is that's going on in that place and then what's going to be causing the conflict and then certainly what are going to be the results of that particular conflict. And so that's really where we're at and that's kind of where we're headed, certainly with the test next week coming up on Thanksgiving break. Hopefully you guys will enjoy your Thanksgiving, whatever it is that you happen to do with your family uh, during Thanksgiving, whether you're traveling or whatnot. Hopefully you, uh, you enjoy yourself and certainly keep safe. I want to give a, a brief shout out to uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe and the Philippines. If you look at uh, the, the other day, the top three uh, countries in terms of views were the United States, Zimbabwe, and the Philippines. So shout out to my friends there uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Appreciate you guys watching. You guys in the Philippines, uh, Southeast Asia, Thanks also for watching, right? We're truly going international. Uh, speaking of going international, I was really afraid there for a moment that Crash Course was going to uh, was going to take over my viewership. But uh, if you've watched the Crash Course channels, you've seen that they've taken those down. So uh, I still have a little bit of time. Still have a little bit of time before John Green is going to uh, to remake those. And thankfully, he's going to remake those. I certainly appreciate the work that he does, but those. Uh, those first two videos were not uh, were not certain were not up to par, uh, not up to his standards, and so looking forward to uh, to some new content that he's going to be putting out. So anyway, uh, that's where we're at. Uh, I kind of gave you a preview on political geography and, and, and where we're going to be headed. Oh, almost forgot uh, what I have started and I meant to do today, but I forgot my camera at home. So well, I have my iPad obviously, but I forgot the camera that hooks up to my computer. Uh, but what I did is I went back and looked at the 2016 exam, uh, checked out the question that most people seem to have a hard time with, which was, uh, which was the question on language in Canada, the idea of the nation state. And so I put together a presentation on that. Uh, hopefully next week sometime I'll be uh, recording that and then I'm going to upload it. Not only am I going to walk through the question in terms of the content of the question, but I'm also going to walk a little bit through FRQs. It really seems like people are... Uh, interested in FRQs. Uh, for some reason there seems to be, I don't know, some people think the FRQ is shrouded in mystery. Not really sure about why that's the case because FRQs I think are a lot more straightforward than some people might uh, some people might understand. So we'll address some of that. Hopefully give you some pointers on how you can write an effective FRQ so you have some better understanding of that as you go into uh, as you go into the exam at the end of this year. So that's where we're at. That's where we're headed. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're enjoying the course. Certainly, if you have any questions, shoot those to me, and I'll be happy to uh, address those in, the, in whatever way I can. And as always, I will see you next time.